everyone. So yeah, uh, so my name is Ahir. I'll be presenting with Howie. We're both from Databricks, and we're super excited to talk to you about uh, our speedy Scala builds uh, on Bazel. So uh, to kick us off, like, who are we? Uh, so we're Databricks. Um, we're unified analytics on the cloud. We're kind of like the Spark people. Uh, we came out of the AMP Lab in 2013 uh, from the team that created Spark. And um, we loved Scala back then, and we continue to use it quite heavily today. Um, so who are we within Databricks? We're, well, we're on the developer tooling team, uh, and our goal really broadly is to make, make sure every Databricks engineer is able to do their best work at Databricks. We want them to be the most productive uh, they've been in their careers. Um, so what we own, we own the different language tool chains, the CI system, uh, Docker, GitHub integration, auto formatting, IntelliJ, basically all the tools that you'll be dealing with on a day to day basis. So, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Databricks is a, a pretty heavy Scala user. Um, so, Spark itself is written in Scala, and all of our back end systems are also written in Scala. Um, we sort of are in the more Java, -y, Java usage of Scala, um, so lots of uh, sort of standard Java libraries that you'll see in uh, at other places. Um, and we actually also have a lot of custom Scala tooling, uh, which we'll get into. Uh, we try to make compile, test, and build faster. Um, so we're a company of about 150 engineers, so every incremental improvement we make is multiplied by 150. Um, so that's sort of the premise of our team. Cool. So today we'll go over sort of four main areas. Um, we'll talk about the process of Bazelifying our Scala builds. Uh, we'll talk about how we do dependency management. And then I'll hand it over to Howie, who's going to talk about how we do cross builds to make it really easy to upgrade between Scala versions. And finally, um, com uh, compiler performance and the investments we've made there. Um, so cool. I'll start us off with uh, the pro of how we got to Bazel. So uh, just sort of a timeline here. So we, we're pretty early Bazel users. Uh, we started way back uh, in fall of 2015. Uh, we did our initial prototype. It was actually just one of our internal hackathons uh, where we're like, okay, it, it can't be that hard to get some subset of our, uh, of our build running on Bazel. So we were able to pull it off in about a week. We got things up and running, um, and we sort of went from there. So we sort of realized over the course of the next few months, we kept tinkering with this project. Uh, and by the second quarter of 2016, we're like, okay, we should just do this. Um, and uh, fast forward to late 2016, we actually did the conversion. We actually uh, deleted SBT. And then fast forward to 2019, uh, we applied the same conversion, the same techniques to our second uh, mono repo. So I'll get into more details uh, as we go along. So, all right, so summer of 2016, uh, what was, what was the state of the world before the migration? Well, we had a, we had a mono repo. Uh, we had about 90 sub projects in our SBT build and about 15,000 lines of SBT build definition. Um, so the motivation was uh, our build was super slow. And when I say slow, I mean no ops were 20 seconds. Um, it's pure SBT overhead. Uh, it was super hard to maintain. Uh, I think this was actually the thing that really pushed us over the edge. There were two to three people who could review or really make any changes in the SBT build. Um, and sort of the last thing was it was really hard to, to make tests robust. Uh, we were always making this trade off of more parallelism versus uh, stability. Um, so as we added more code, more engineers, more tests, they just got slower and there really wasn't much we could do about it. Um, and but one thing we realized is sort of doing a wholesale migration saying, we're going to merge one pull request that's going to convert everything to Bazel was too large and really too risky to do in a single pass. So we took this approach of maintaining parallel builds over the course of a three to four month window, um, and we built some tooling like an SBT plugin to generate some like our Bazel build so we could kind of maintain this with uh, as little overhead uh, as possible. Um, so uh, yeah, so by September of 2016, we had fully deleted uh, the SBT build. Uh, so we'd spent those six odd months building out the migration tooling, actually doing the migration of each sub-project, onboarding new projects to Bazel, and by September of 2016, uh, local developer laptops, all of CI, everything was running on Bazel. Um, so fast, fast forward to summer of 2019, 
we started hitting these similar problems in our second mono repo. Um, so, but here the 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 core was actually slightly different. So the reason we didn't migrate this repo initially was that in terms of the number of projects, uh, the overhead of the build, uh, it was a lot. Uh, a lot less impactful. But what this repo had instead was a ton, a ton of tests. So as these tests grew, our test times grew from an hour to three to four hours. And as I mentioned before, it was really hard to make tests both fast and stable. Uh, we had tons of flakiness in CI just to, just due to inter test interference. Um, and we couldn't, yeah, we couldn't parallelize beyond 4x. Um, so Bazel, as we had learned, just runs things in sandboxes. It's, you have to try pretty hard to make a Bazel test interfere with another test. Um, so at the time, uh, at the beginning of this migration, we had about 20 sub, sub projects and an SBD build of like 1.5k lines, which is an order of magnitude smaller than our original mono repo. Um, so just to go a little bit further into the motivation, it's not that we had seen these problems, we're like, no, it's fine, like, whatever. We'll just wait until it gets really bad. We actually tried. So in 2017, we got a lot of complaints. Hey, my PRs take a long time. It'd be great if you could parallelize tests. We tried. Uh, hey, testing, like, tests don't run in parallel. It's slow. Try it again. Uh, it sucks having to wait three hours. It's like, okay, let's, let's do it for real this time. Let's, let's go to the thing that we know works. So you can actually see here kind of the test time and you'll see it sort of lines up at different points where uh, we actually tried paralyzing things. So you'll see around like June of 2018, uh, between May and June, we worked really hard and we paralyzed a bunch of things. And then damn engineers kept adding more tests and it kept going back up. Um, so we couldn't just throw, this wasn't, this isn't just a question of throwing more cores at it. If we could just solve this problem with money and more cores, we would have done it. Uh, but we can't. We're sort of bounded by these, uh, the sort of underlying infrastructure and, and how much parallelism we can eke out of the system because things interfere with each other. Um, so we started this migration in the uh, summer of this year. Um, and after we went through the migration process, somewhat similarly to what we did for our original mono repo, we improved test times by five to six X. And not only did we, it, uh, we were able to have more parallelism, we also, now this just let us throw whatever large AWS instance comes out next, we'll just throw it at CI. And, um, and we just get the parallelism for free. Um, so we still keep the SVT build around uh, for local development for this mono repo. And uh, it's uh, more usable than our, than our Bazel build at the moment. But ideally, we're hoping to sort of switch all the entire development workflow to use uh, Bazel. Um, cool. So yeah, here's actually the, the uh, the test time sort of over time. Um, so what we had done, the way we'd, go we'd gone about this migration, is that we started with the SBT build and we rolled out a Bazel build. And initially the Bazel build didn't really do much of anything. It just compiled things. Uh, so what we did was as we incrementally ported tests over, made them stable, make them work in the sandbox environment, we would remove them from running in CI in the SBT build. So that's why you see these two lines sort of converging on each other every time uh, we added a test to Bazel, we would remove it from SBT. So as you can see, we moved, we moved, we moved. Uh, we got from an average test runtime of 150 minutes down to today, I think about 25 minutes. So we run the SBT build, which is literally just compiling and running two or three tests that we haven't ported yet. Uh, and you'll see that takes about the same time as the Bazel build that also compiles and runs the other 1,597 tests. So the parallelism uh, really helps and sort of having these, the, the primitives or the foundations to, to be able to say, hey, I can run this test, it's isolated and I don't really need to think about it anymore is really powerful. So what's the current state of Bazel at Databricks? Uh, we have about 1,400 Scala modules, uh, 1.7K lines of Scala. And uh, to be clear, this is across both of the mono repos. Um, tests run up to 96X parallelism. If we give this talk again, it'll be whatever the largest AWS instance is um, without flakiness. Um, and uh, some other things that we're not going to spend too much time on, but these other things that Bazel gives you, uh, distributed build cache, when we rolled that out in 2018, we cut down our CI compile times by 7x. Uh, so that made people pretty happy. Uh, and it was really easy to implement sort of new build related functionality across both of these mono repos. I think one of the most impactful was. Uh, 
selective test running. So the core idea here being that when I make a pull request, uh, I should be able to do some pretty simple analysis to say, oh, okay, these are the files that were changed. What are the downstream tests and targets that I actually need to compile and run again? So most pull requests or most changes really don't need to run all of the tests in the repo. Uh, most of them run a much smaller subset. So this really cut down on pull request times and really minimized the impact of flaky tests where they still around. Um, cool. So moving along, uh, next we'll jump into how we do dependency management in Bazel. Um, so just to sort of set the context here, you're probably all familiar, but dependency management is something that's common to all programming languages, um, at least ones that people use. Uh, so languages tend to build their own set of tools for managing dependencies. Uh, Java and Scala use the Maven ecosystem. JavaScript has NPM, Python, PyPy, et cetera. Uh, Bazel, at least at the time of our migration, didn't really have any uh, built-in support for this. Um, so uh, what we did was we're like, okay, well, if we're going to do dependency management, let's sort of set some requirements, set some goals uh, to try to adhere to after having learned the lessons of uh, sort of painful uh, dependency management problems in SBT and Maven and sort of our other uh, package managers that we deal with. Um, so the first goal is reproducibility. So uh, what that means really concretely is that a commit must be fully self-describing and reproducible. This kind of sounds crazy when you when I like when I say it um, because it seems pretty obvious. When I build a commit, if I build it today or I build it tomorrow, it should produce the same code. Um, and this is largely true in the Java ecosystem. It's not necessarily true in NPM or really depending on how you set your IV config in SBT. Um, so the results of the build should not change over time. Uh, and uh, dependency should be reflected kind of in an understandable way in the commit. It should be really hard to introduce a dependency change that people didn't know happened. Um, so this sort of leads in the next one. All dependencies must be locked. So dependencies can't differ based on the environment in which things are executing. Um, we really don't want M2 cache pollution, NPM cache pollution. We really don't want that to be the problem. We never want to tell people, hey, this doesn't work uh, on your machine, just try it somewhere else. Um, so uh, and the, uh, another really important one is uh, speed and stability. Dependency resolution really shouldn't impact build, perform build performance. Uh, some ecosystems have really slow dependency resolution. Um, and this sort of leads into try like, avoid pulling from external repositories at build time. Uh, I, we've all probably had twiddled our thumbs when Maven Central was down or we've been owned by like NPM, like, or sorry, we've been, we've had CI breaks because NPM took down a package. Um, repositories can disappear. That's happened. That's fun. Uh, and sometimes repos just get owned. Uh, I won't name the resolver, but uh, for a while we were, we weren't getting jars. We were getting cat pictures from one of our third party resolvers. Um, that was a really weird discovery. Um, so, okay, so what's our approach? The approach is to resolve dependencies outside of the build system. Um, we want to remove dependency resolution from the critical path of development. Um, the, the core idea here is you can only really do this if you, if you believe that dependency changes are actually infrequent. Um, so if they're infrequent, we should avoid redundant resolution in every build. Um, so what this becomes concretely is that we've materialized dependencies into Bazel build files. These dependent, these generated build files are lock files uh, that are just committed into the repository. So it's really easy to see artifact versions. It's really easy to understand what changed. Uh, and finally, when we resolve these, we don't, we don't resolve them and say, okay, I'm going to go pull this from Maven Central. At resolution time, we simply mirror things into an internal S3 bucket. Uh, a content addressable hash, uh, content addressable store. Uh, so we don't rely on any external systems that can go down, and we also avoid storing large artifacts in Git. So Git doesn't tip over, you know, anytime I add a new dependency. Um, so the workflow is pretty straightforward. We uh, define or update dependencies in just a standard Maven POM. We run a little tool that reads in the POM and spits out build files. This also uh, we'll upload all of the files to S3, and then we generate, we depend on the generated build files within our project. So looking at this, um, what we have at the top is just part of a Maven POM. This thing is fed into like our Maven update script. It will spit out a bunch of build files. Uh, so here's actually the, the, ba the, the result of the Bazel query that generates this like dependency graph. So we've got, um, uh, 
uh, the Jackson Scala module and this guy recursively depends on like Paranamer and Jackson core and Datapind and Scala library itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah okay so to take a step back we contrast this with SBT um the dependency resolution is is fast and, and really reliable and this is just mostly a function of we put stuff on S3 and we don't rely on Maven central. Um version upgrades are fully expanded in generated source so things are auditable when I make a change to dependency I understand not just that change but anything recursively that might have happened. Um so it's makes it easy to ensure that like mysterious versions don't get pulled in. Um and we've set it up such that any module that shares a dependency with another module uh there's no divergence there's no notion of per module dependency overwriting. Um so we don't really have these surprise binary compatibility issues in production anymore you should they'll happen locally in your tests instead uh where if they crop up. Um cool so now I'll hand it over to Howie to cover cross building. Hey, thanks I hear. Um so I will cover cross building and the compilation performance we put in to make working with Scala data bricks uh comfortable. First cross building. Um the basic problem with cross building is what to do if I'm building a module or a library that needs to be used across multiple Scala versions. And maybe SVT support sets built in. But when you think about it further this applies to much more than just Scala versions. Spark versions, maybe you have, have different versions of Jetty in different parts of the code base. We want to test different JVMs in different parts of the code base because some team wants to use the new, um, the new ZGC, but some other team wants to be on a more stable uh, JVM they've been running for a long time. So all of these are basically the same problem, where I want to do the same module or the same test, but with one facet which is different from what it was previously. <coughs> the way we do uh, cross builds I data bricks is via cross th this uh, helper called Cross Scala Library. So this is a Bazel build definition which says I have a Scala library in this folder. Its name is auth, there's z sources, there's a Scala version. And this is slightly simplified but more or less this covers how you define a Scala library. Um if you want to cross build a Scala library what you do is you write cross Scala lib. This is something that we implemented ourselves. Um and you just give it multiple Scala versions and possible multiple Spark versions or e even multiple different axes, JVM versions, etc that you want this uh, module to be built against. And this will generate basically a matrix of modules that exist in the same folder all suffixed with how they are uh, defined. So you have a 2.11 version, 2.12 version, you have Spark 2.3 version, Spark 2.4 version. And it effectively just expands out in, uh, as a for loop or maybe two for loops to give you a whole bunch of um, separate modules. So why do we do it like this versus say SBT where you have a global flag which sets a Scala version plus plus two twelve ten plus plus two thirteen one. Um uh yeah so this is more that's what I just showed you earlier. Um the big advantage of doing this is that we can cross build against any axes we want including multiple axes. So a lot of our code cross builds against two axes, Scala versions and Spark versions because Databricks has to support many different Spark versions and the different Spark versions use different, uh, different dependency trees and are binary incompatible with each other. And occasionally we have other cross builds. For example, we cross build against different Jetty versions during a big upgrade so we could build and test both at the same time. And build, we may build against different JVM versions if we're doing a JVM upgrade. Um, compared to SBT where it's global, in Bazel, the way we've set it up, the different modules cross build against different versions of dependencies are totally separate, which means that it can be compiled in parallel, they can be tested in parallel, and Bazel knows that all this is one big graph that you can query and run all your normal commands over. There's no magic that's cross building. Cross builds are just separate sets of dependencies, se separate uh, graphs of modules, each of which with a different suffix, underscore 211, underscore 212. And the normal Bazel queries like Bazel test everything will really cross build and cross test against every single version in your repository. Um, the other thing is that the build tool Bazel is aware of which modules support which versions by virtue of whether it has underscore 211, 212, underscore spark 2324 suffix. That means it is impossible to select a version of X that if you take a module, it's, un it's impossible to select a version of a cross build that is unsupported. Um, for example, if I try to, if a module is only supported for Scala 2.11 and Scala 2.12, I cannot s build it against Scala 2.10. The build tool will just tell you, nope, this is not supported. There is no 2.10 version for this module. 
And these errors happen even before compilation starts. So it's not like you get the compile error, which is weird, or worse, you get a runtime error with like a method not found exception due to binding compatibility. The build tool just tells you there is no 2.10 version here. And this even ap applies to dependencies. So if I am Scala 2.10, 2.11, and he is Scala 2.12, if I try to depend my module on him, I'll again get an error saying that, oh, he does not support Scala to um, 10 to 11. I will not even bother trying to compile it. So this gives you quite a good user experience, even when you have quite a messy uh, matrix of cross builds, as we do for Spark, Scala, and other axes. Um, cross building also makes upgrading easier. So apart from SVT, many other build tools do not support building multiple versions of Scala in your code base or even multiple versions of anything in your code base. The whole code base must be on the same version, which means that if you have some like, legacy dependency that's dependent on some old version of Spark that's stuck on Scala 2.10, your whole code base is stuck on Scala 2.10. Even your totally separate web services or API servers do not share any class path with your legacy dependency at all, because many of these build tools do not support cross-building. Um, in, in contrast, Databricks has code for Scala 2.10, Scala 2.11, Scala 2.12, all built, tested, and worked on actively and concurrently by different parts of the company. So the web services, new version of Spark is 2.12. Most of Spark is 2.11. We have some old version of Spark that customers still need to use, yeah, in 2.10. And they all can live happily in one repository, and there's no big bang upgrade. You just add new cross builds to the, ver to the modules which need to be cross built against different versions. Um, and because of they all live happily in one uh, repository, upgrades are really easy. So upgrading everything from Scala 2.10 to Scala 2.12 that we have upgraded so far, um, that took like a quarter worth of one person worth of work. So it wasn't a lot of work to do a huge version upgrade for maybe a several hundred modules all into a new version of Scala with several incompatibilities. Um, <clears throat> so after cross-building, the last thing I'll talk about is compilation performance. So compilation performance is a bit of a lingering problem for the Scala language. It compiles orders of magnitude slower than Java, then Go, even Kotlin is, is compiled somewhat slowly, compiles much faster than Java, than Scala. Um, and it's a big problem in our code base. It's always been a big problem. So when you have a million lines of Scala and 7,000 source files, it takes a while. Um, and we send out surveys to our developers twice a year, and we get feedback like, building takes too long, building it takes 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes it takes 30 seconds, sometimes it takes 90 seconds, is always too slow and gets in the way of people's productivity. People do not want to sit there watching their code compile. So as a, two example uh, modules I'll use for this section of the presentation, we'll consider common, which is a common module that many of our downstream dependencies use. It has a lot, lot of code itself, but not very many transitive dependencies, and as well as application, which is a web application that has not that much code itself, but depends on a lot, because this is the thing we're actually deploying to production, depends on the rest of our uh, libraries. Common has a graph that looks something like this if you do the Bazel query and print it out. So initially, back in 2015, 2016, the naive compilation of, of, of app and common looks something like this, where app would take 15 plus minutes, Common would take three minutes to compile cleanly. And if you make a single change, like add a print line, remove a logging statement, app would take 30 seconds to recompile, and common would take 40 seconds. I mean, this is somewhat expected given the relative numbers of source files and relative number of transitive dependencies for each of these modules. Um, part of the reason this is slow is that, at least when we started initially, the naive Bazel Scala integration would spin up a separate Scala compiler for every module that you compile. And this is inefficient because Scala compiles are expensive. They take a long time to warm up. If you spin one up and throw it away, you're not getting any benefit from the JVM performance. We're getting a lot of penalty due to the JVM startup overhead. Um, so Bazel does support worker processes, which we had to kind of wire up ourselves, um, where you have multiple, uh, multiple modules which share the same compiler process. So compiler process lasts a long time and can get properly warmed up and jittered and fast, taking advantage of the JVM um, optimizations. And we took a step further and consolidated them all into a single worker process. Um, and the reason for that is simply that uh, the compile worker is quite a heavy piece of software. It takes one or two gigabytes of memory in order to run. And you might as well have one of them rather than three two gigabyte uh, processes hogging memory on your laptop. So worker processes cut down uh, compile times by about three to four x over across the board just from having a hot JVM versus a cold JVM. What's next? 
The next big speed that we got was upgrading to Scala 2.12. As I mentioned earlier, we took about a one quarter, one person upgrade. And the big motivation upgrade was compile times. So this is the uh, uh, light band uh, Scala team's compi compile time benchmark. And previously, we were on 2.10, because that's what uh, was available when the company started. And when we did the upgrade, um, 2.12 was already a lot faster than 2.10 was at compiling things. If you look at it today, it's even faster. Two, the Scala 2.12 compiler is literally twice as fast as the Scala 2.10 compiler was back in the day. So we did the upgrade. We spent a bunch of time cross-building things, making sure everything worked, validating testing. And we also validated that this performance improvement in compilation also applied to our own code base, not just the benchmarks that Lightband was maintaining. So if you look across many different modules of many different kinds, we all, our compilation performance almost doubled. Thing took half as long to compile as it did in two. Things took half as long to compile in 2.12 as it did in 2.10. And the, if you look at the two benchmarks that we had earlier, you can see that the clear speed up in compile times were visible. The next speed that we got was from remote caching. So this is something that Bazel supports built in, not just for Scala, but for anything you're going to do. So you're compiling Golang modules, you're bundling a JavaScript code, creating Docker tarballs. Bazel allows you to share the output of compilation from one laptop on another laptop. So when it compiles, it gets sent to a remote cache server, which is just some kind of um, uh, S3 bucket with Nginx in front of it. And anyone else who compiles the same thing will also can just download from the bucket rather than having to recompile themselves. Um, so this does not affect delta builds at all, because if you're just adding a print line, the chances are no one else has added the exact same print line to their debugging dev environment. But for clean builds, it sped things up by maybe 3 to 4x. Instead of compiling the world, you're just downloading a bunch of jars from S3, and you're done. Um, so that was great. And it affects everything, not just Scala. So Docker is faster. JavaScript bundles faster. It's great. Um, the next thing we did was cloud dev boxes. So the idea here is that rather than having your laptop compiling everything on your machine and having to act, act, interact with all these remote services, why not just send your code, which is relatively small, like kilobytes of code, over to an EC2 machine, which is co-located in the same data center as all these things that that machine needs to access? Not only is it co-located with all the other services, it also is a lot faster than your machine. Like um, by default, we give people 16 gigs of RAM, sorry, 16 cores and 64 gigs of RAM on the dev box. And you can ask for 96 cores and 384 gigs of RAM if you really want to compile and run a lot of tests at the same time. And we'll just give it to you. It costs $5 an hour. So if you're just turning it on for two hours and turning it off, it's perfectly fine. Um, and lastly, the dev box doesn't have all this stuff that runs on a laptop hogging resources that's taking away resources that could be used for compilation. Like you have IntelliJ using four gigs of RAM. You have Visual Studio Code's Electron. You have your antivirus software. You have Gmail taking up one gig of RAM and Slack taking up two gigs of RAM because they uh, use up a lot of memory. Um, and why should all this be fighting with the Scala compiler, Bazel, and Docker for resources? And the answer is they don't really need to be. You can run all these locally, and you can run the, your build tooling in the dev box, and you're both running perfectly happily. Your laptop does not get hot, and your build does not get slow, and everyone is happy. Um, so the experience of using a dev box looks something like this. Um, I can compile something. Mm. You see here it passed. Um, let's run that again. So the first time you compile it, that it, it, it passes, I make a change. You see it syncs basically instantly. And you go back to your terminal, you run the thing, it, your change is there, it will fail. You can fix it, and it syncs again. Um, so basically, the cloud dev boxes basically give you a local development experience, but with a remote development performance which is basically the best of both worlds. You don't, you don't need to be thinking about git pushing, git pulling, about calling rsync on the correct folders or correct files. You just edit, it syncs, you compile, you test, everything works, um, but just faster. How much faster? Um, so for non-cached things, which are not present in remote cache, we found that Cloud Dev Boxes basically doubled the performance of our Scala compiler. So running on the EC2 machine with 16 cores and 64 gigs of RAM is twice as fast as running on a um, laptop with four cores and 16 gigs of RAM and Slack and Gmail and antivirus and all those other things. So twice as fast is impressive, but even more impressive is if things are remote cached, everything is already in S3, I just need to download it. It literally takes one or two seconds to download everything onto a cloud dev box. 
And like, why shouldn't it, right? Because your dev box has 10 gigabit per second Ethernet connected to the next, to your remote cache, which is probably in the same data center. And you're probably not having 10 gigabits of jars, are you? You're just having a few hundred megabytes. So it should take one or two seconds. And once that's downloaded, you can just immediately start working without having to wait any longer. So two seconds down from 15 minutes was a pretty good uh, speed up for clean builds. And lastly, we, all this we were using here was not using the Zinc incremental compiler. So that's recompiling the whole module from scratch every time you make a change. Um, and with Zinc, that speeds up the, the delta builds from five seconds to recompile the whole module, maybe a few dozen files, to one second to recompile the file you care about. And that helps speed up, do the last mile to speed up the delta builds by just adding a print line interactively debugging. So in conclusion, we've covered these topics. So Bazel, Fang, our Scala builds, where we discovered that even though Bazel's a large investment, if you look at the timeline we saw earlier, it's literally a five, four years of work with many periods of intense activity to try and get us over to Bazel. It was definitely worth it for our large code base. Um, we talked about OSS dependency management because Bazel doesn't support it. And we had to roll our own. But in doing so, I think our own was better than most of what is out there. Like we get log files, you get auditable dependencies. It's fast. You never, you never fail due to Maven Central being down. It's great. Um, Cross-building, where we found that we could cross-build against any axis we want, not just Scala versions. And it made lots of upgrades and other things much easier than if we couldn't do that. And lastly, compilation performance, where Scala compiler performance is slow, but with a bunch of work, not just on the compiler side, but also language side and cloud infrastructure side, we've managed to bring these 30 second to 15 minute workflows down to one second to 30 second workflows. And the Scala compiler performance has more or less dropped off the feedback that our engineers give us. They have other things to complain about, but they don't complain about Scala compiler performance anymore. Um, and I have a few references. If you want to Google these, I'll, we'll send out the slides later. The blog posts and talks have been about this before if you want to learn more. Um, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.